So, dann einen wunderschönen guten Morgen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Nonlinear Optics. A few a number of students. I hope not everybody was infected with Corona. Uh, well, jokes aside, uh, actually not a good joke. Well, uh, I hope uh, you all um, are responsible. And what I re recommend, I said a few words about booster vaccination and things like that. Um, and uh, another, another, another advice would be that you, um, that you um, take a test twice a week or so. Right, so the university offers that. Um, I also do that, um, of course, just before the lecture, in order to be sure that I'm, that I don't spread anything besides nonlinear optics. Okay, so let's start. What we did uh, last time was uh, to start with, um, well, what we did in particular was the electro-optic effect. So this was the main body of the last lecture. Um, but then we started, we were a little bit faster than I anticipated, so we started with the next chapter, namely a survey of nonlinear effects. Um, and what we are doing there is, is really, really trivial, but by doing this, we learn actually quite a bit. Um, kind of amazing. So um, we started here with this... Um, well, power series expansion uh, that you see here of the polarization. So we have the usual term, we just decorate it with a one in order to indicate that's the linear part. But then uh, we introduce new parts that you didn't see in uh, the second semester in a um, course on electrodynamics. Um, and, well, of course, you can continue the power series expansion to the term that you wish um, the most important uh, ones are the second and the third order nonlinear terms because of their markedly different behavior. And we'll learn about that in, um, in the course of this course. Um, so what we then uh, did was to take this guy here and um, just to plug in some um, Yes, uh, some monochromatic wave. So we have here a monochromatic wave, and we plug it into this expression, right? And um, well, we do the calculation, um, which is very, very simple because because of this complex notation, and so it's very easy to arrive at at this expression here. Well, but before we do so, actually, I would like to. Well, to look uh, once again a little bit back and to, um, and to ask you a question on, on what we did last time, namely the contracted notation. We introduced it in the course of the electro-optic effect, but as I explained already, it's also important for, for all second-order processes like the ones that we study. Not immediately, but we'll come to... Ah, yeah, activity not found. That's, what, uh, that's not very nice. Mm -hmm. So let's see whether we can fix this. So I may be out of luck with my, with my pulse. Okay, so it's here it is. Right, so. so you don't see it here. So uh, then let me uh, just say um, what the question was, namely contracted notion. What is the contracted index for the index pair 1, 3? Right? So if we have uh, the index pair 1, 3, what is uh, the contracted index for that? And uh, there are three alternatives, uh, namely four, five, and six. Um, 
I think I received the results here. I'm not sure actually. So maybe we uh, just do it the classical way. I just ask the audience what is what is the right response? Four, five, or six? I think that uh, five because the sum of the numerators and the orders in this case uh, has to be nine. Yeah, so you, are, uh, you remember my, my donkey's bridge, right? Uh, saying that, that the sum uh, of the three, so one, three, one plus three plus the question uh, I asked uh, should be nine, and this is, of course, five. So uh, let's see whether this uh, damned thing uh, works for the next one. Ah, yeah. So for the next one, it works. That's nice. So suppose the intensity is so high that second order polarization needs to be included, but not third order polarization, right? And then the question is at which frequency or frequencies will the polarization oscillate? Yeah, suppose the intensity is so high that um, second order polarization needs to be included. At which frequencies or frequencies will the polarization oscillate? Think carefully. So there's somebody asking, uh, uh, somebody, uh, so somebody or a few people are responding, B, who is this? Nobody from here? No? Well, this person is also right. Yeah? I didn't ask here about, um, about the nonlinear polarization. I asked about the polarization in general. Right? And therefore, A, uh, B, and C are the right answers. Right? In particular, A is uh, a correct answer. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, glad to see that you learn quickly. <laughs> OK, yeah. Um, so let's go back to the, uh, yeah. Uh, so let's back, go back to the, to the script. Yeah. So what you see is that we just uh, took here the square, and then we calculated these terms, and we found, maybe to our surprise, this constant term, and we said that this is optical rectification, that this is a DC field, quite obviously it is. It has no time dependence in contrast to the one that produces second-order polarization. But remember, what I have here is just the second order polarization, and what I asked before was first order plus second order polarization, right? Therefore, uh, you don't find here a term that oscillates at the fundamental. Okay, let's look at this term here with another, uh, with another question here. Yeah, so what about, so can we switch to the next, yeah? So what about the polarization oscillating, uh, in quotation marks, at zero omega? What can we measure, question mark, right? A static field decaying with one over r, a static field dec uh, decaying with one over r squared, a static field in the crystal or nothing. So nothing, a static field in the crystal. Yeah, so uh, C wins by a small margin, I have to say. OK, uh, I'm glad that nobody um, choose A and B, right, because we have a static, f it's a polarization, right? Um, and so uh, it shouldn't, it's not a charge, right? 
So it uh, shouldn't decay with 1 over r or 1 over r squared. Um, a static field in the crystal, so this is the correct answer. We would, we could measure with some, yeah, um, with some good idea, we could measure the static field in the crystal. Who is doing this here? Somebody is choking here, right? No, it was me. I negotiated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> Don't mind. <laughs> you can correct it, uh, by the way, uh, if you mistyped it. Okay. So, um, good enough for optical rectification. So, um, let's take a few notes on that. So, second order um, polarization. Um, yes. So, we take a few notes on that. Um, we see that um, second order uh, polarization consists of a contribution um, oscillating at two omega um, as expected, as certainly expected. And a component that represents that represents um, a DC field. I should mention here the following thing. Suppose you don't use a monochromatic wave that you want to frequency double and inadvertently you also get a DC field. But suppose you take a short pulse, such as a femtosecond laser pulse or something like that, and you send it through this crystal. Right? Then what you get out is, of course, the second harmonic of this femtosecond laser pulse. Say uh, you had 800 nanometers, then you get 400 nanometers. You can see it as blue light or so. But we know that there is also, the, that there is also optical rectification. Now the interesting point is that this femtosecond laser pulse is not precisely a static field. Rather, it is time varying and reasonably quick, uh, quickly time varying. Yeah? So one optical period at 800 nanometer has a duration of two and a half femtoseconds and say you have a 25 femtosecond pulse, then this is also, yeah, that's not really a DC field. So and it, because it's not a DC field, so you can actually calculate in which frequency range this pulse is, namely in the terahertz. And what you get consequently is a terahertz pulse. This is one way, actually quite a good way, to produce terahertz waves. You know that terahertz waves, that this is a spectral region, that's quite um, kind of difficult to access in terms of producing these waves, but also in terms of detecting these waves. But they are very useful um, because, because, um, yeah, uh, because of different things. Yeah? So uh, one prominent example is, uh, is security at, at, at an airport. Yeah? So you have these, these body scanners, and they use actually terahertz radiation. OK. Good. So um, we have a component that represents a DC field, or if we have a short pulse as a fundamental, then it's a quasi DC field. Okay, yeah. So the first term that's clear leads to second harmonic generation. The first term leads to second harmonic generation, SHG, yeah, um, the second one, 
um, cannot uh, produce um, an electromagnetic wave unless Uh, the fundamental is short. Is short um, such as a femtosecond pulse, such as a femtosecond pulse. And then we would get terahertz pulses. So, what do you think about second harmonic? Oh, there's a question. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to admit that I think you uh, exchanged the word first and second. I oh. So, um, let's, let's read what I wrote. Uh, we see that second order uh, polarization consists of a contribution oscillating at 2 omega and a component that represents. Um, a DC field. So the first t term leads to second harmonic generation, right? This is the second term, actually. No, the. F so, ah. <laughs> so the first term, uh, so uh, this refers to this sentence. Ah, I'm sorry. Yeah. But uh, you are right. Yeah. So um, it would have been even better if I would have uh, written this here. Then it would. Yeah, so we are both right. Yeah, so that's a good compromise. Thank you. But it's clear now what we mean. Um, yeah? Sorry, one question. When you say the, uh, the second term cannot generate an electromagnetic wave unless it's fundamentally short, are you talking about the time continuum? Uh, uh, I'm talking about what? The pump beam, yeah? So the fundamental, this is the incident beam on the crystal. So the question, uh, yeah, so I should repeat uh, the question because the microphone here in the room is probably uh, not good enough to transmit it to those who attend on YouTube. Um, yeah, so the question was what I mean by the fundamental. So the fundamental is the incident radiation. You can say so, yeah? So quite often people would refer to the fundamental as, a, uh, as the pump beam, although um, we would use pump beam more for a pump rope scheme, yeah? But, uh, you know, it's just language, and uh, we sometimes use language, sometimes we abuse it, um, yeah? And sometimes we are more strict, sometimes we are less strict. And uh, it's generally the context that explains it. Thank you. So, um, yeah, uh, I also have a question for you. Um, talking about second harmonic generation, what do you think how efficient it can be? So uh, which percentage, that would have been a good uh, poll here again. What percentage of the incident radiation do you think one could convert to the second harmonic? 10%, 50%, 100%? What's right? You mean to say uh, percentage of what? Uh, total energy? Of the total energy. Suppose we have, um, we have an infrared beam, right? We, s we want to produce green light, right? So we have 10 watts of, um, of infrared light. We send it through um, a nonlinear crystal. How much of these incident 10 watts can be converted to green? 10%, 50%, 100%? So it can't be more than 100%, that's sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the frequency is higher. Yeah. So I would put a power meter that measures the green light. And how much can it be? 10% 10 10 is one, one guess. And if you can increase the intensity, then you can exceed 10 
So you say almost 100%? Yeah, everybody else agrees? Yeah, so those who have been in a lab, yeah, so it can be pretty efficient. Yeah, so we can convert close to, asymptotically, under ideal conditions, you can convert 100%. And we'll calculate that at some point. Yeah, uh, will be a nice uh, calculation, actually. So um, let's write that down. Under proper conditions, yeah, um, perhaps idealized conditions, under proper conditions, second harmonic generation can have an efficiency close to 100%. Yeah. And um, the common application is, of course, to produce, to produce visible laser-like radiation from infrared radiation. And the reason is that infrared uh, laser radiation can fairly easily and actually also fairly cheap be produced by, by laser diets. Typical laser diets, they work in the red infrared um, region. Well, there are also some that work in the, in the blue. But what about green? So say you want to produce a laser, a laser television thing, yeah? so a laser, so a beamer with, with, with lasers, then um, yeah, red laser, this is, uh, this is available, a blue laser is also available, but no green laser. And, but we have not linear optics after all. Yeah? Um, so a common application is to produce visible light from laser, uh, from infrared light that's produced by a laser diet. Common application, the generation of um, visible light, visible laser light, of course, um, from IR light, laser light. Of course, there are many, yeah, so there is a countless number of other applications where second harmonic generation is used, not only for producing light um, in order to apply, apply this light for something, but also to produce light in order to detect something. So a common application is the measurement of the duration of ultra-short pulses. Yeah, so say, uh, just to depict this here, say um, you have a very short laser pulse, a femtosecond laser pulse, then um, you actually have no chance to measure this with electronics because this pulse is way too short. The shortest things you can measure electronically are in the order of, of picoseconds. Right? And even this is, is quite fast. So think of a computer with a clock rate of, of a gigahertz, or maybe a few gigahertz. One gigahertz corresponds to a nanosecond. So this is a million times longer than, than femtoseconds, or 100,000 times longer than 10 femtoseconds, which is a typical pulse duration. The only chance to measure such a pulse is to measure it by itself. Yeah? And we call this autocorrelation. So what you would do is that you, um, that you split your beam, build kind of a Michelson interferometer, right? so that one goes uh, this way uh, to this mirror here, uh, the other goes this way, and you can move one of both, right? and so both beams are recombined here, and you send it through a second harmonic crystal. Right? When there's only, yeah, so when, the, when both pulses are not overlapped, then the intensity is low. But when they are overlapped, the intensity is twice as big. But because it's a nonlinear effect, the blue light that comes out is four times as large. 
right? So, um, so this is a, this is an application that goes beyond uh, just producing light. We measure something with light, and actually, this is one of the most important applications of nonlinear optics to realize new detection schemes, and we'll uh, come to a few in the course of this lecture here. So um, let's also talk about a photon picture, or I could say a quantum picture of the process. So the quantum picture would be that we count photons. Um, and we can sketch a simple, yeah, a simple drawing. What we have is, yeah, so consider this rectangle here is a, um, uh, is a crystal, so there's light incident with frequency omega. We have a high two process, and out comes, of course, light with uh, this frequency omega that has not been converted, but also the frequency doubled light. And if you want to depict this in a level scheme, then uh, we would have here virtual two virtual levels. Yeah, like this, and then um, we would have we, we would have two photons being absorbed, two photons um, of frequency omega being yeah absorbed is the wrong way, but uh, destroyed I should say, and one with two omega created. So um, two photons. H bar omega are destroyed. One photon H bar two omega is created. Good. Let's look at the polarization that is responsible for second harmonic generation in a little bit more detail. And, well, uh, I would like to develop one property um, that we will use later. It's not very important, but nevertheless, um, we should look at it. So the polarization, the polarization creating Second harmonic generation, the second harmonic uh, creating the second harmonic. Yeah, so we take from this uh, calculation here, we take here, uh, we take this part. Um, this is P2 of t um, equals epsilon zero times chi two times the amplitude twice, right? Um, and then we have e to the minus i omega, two omega uh, t. And then the complex conjugate of that. So we have e star times e star, and then e to the plus Two i omega t, yeah. And what we can do is um, to write this a little bit differently. Yeah. So we could say that this second order polarization, which is an observable, so it's a real quantity, that we can write this as a complex quantity. We can write it as p of two omega where p, uh, this p of 2 omega is a complex quantity, well, of course, we will have to make up for that by adding the complex conjugate. But instead of writing p star, I write here um, p of minus 2 omega, right? which is equal to p star, 
right? And if you substitute uh, what, we, what we had, or if you compare it uh, to what we wrote down, just a few lines above, yeah, then you see um, that, this is, uh, that this is actually correct. So we have then two omega t, right? And p of two omega is of course given by epsilon zero times chi two times e times e. And p of minus two omega is equal to epsilon zero times chi two times e star times e star. So remember, um, when we introduced uh, complex not notation, we found that e star, um, that, um, yeah, so that the complex conjugate um, of, the, of the amplitude is equal to the amplitude at the negative frequency. We had this in the first chapter. And uh, you see the same thing here. Okay, well, now we want to um, go one step further, namely, instead of just shining or illuminating this crystal with a single frequency, we want to illuminate it with two frequencies, with two electric fields, so with two, say, laser beams, and if you look at, um, at this polarization, well, where do we have it? Yeah. So um, you see that using here two fields makes no sense for, for, linear, uh, for the linear case. For the second order case, we can in principle think of two fields here, right? Because, uh, well, what, um, what this means is that we have uh, E times E, and for third order processes, we could actually use three different laser beams, say, of different color, right? So far, we also took two beams, say, uh, with the same color, right? So you could think of um, splitting the beam that is incident on the, on the crystal as two different beams. But now we want to take actually two beams that have a different frequency, different color. And, well, guess what it will result in? So what do you expect if we have two colors? Hmm? They could sum up into new frequencies. Okay, so this is what we certainly expect. Let's see whether we get something more, right? Okay, so um, the headline says it already, namely sum and difference frequency generation. 2.3, 2.3, sum and difference frequency generation. Yeah, so um, we do what we announced. So instead of using one frequencies, instead of just one incident field, we use a two color field. Of course, you can also use um, a three-color field, but this crystal will always just work with, two, with, with a pair of them. Right? So with the first and the second, with the second and the third, and with the first and the third. Right? You can um, shine as many frequencies on the crystal uh, as you wish, but uh, it's obvious from, from our Taylor series expansion that only two of them will be, well, will be combined to produce something new. 
So without loss of generality, we can res uh, restrict ourselves to two color fields if we speak about second order processes. So we have now amplitude at the first frequency and it oscillates, of course, at omega one. And then we have the second amplitude and the corresponding frequency, omega two. And in order to make it real, this field, we add the complex conjugate, right? And then we do this stupid calculation of taking the square of that, and let's see what we get. So, um, what we get is that P2 of T, by definition, yeah, we write it as E of T squared, and then if we plug in um, this equation above, the uh, first equation here on this page, then we get, of course, E1 squared times E to the minus 2i omega t, omega 1 t, of course, plus same thing for the second field, for the second frequency, e to the minus 2i omega 2 t. Then uh, we have two times e1 times e2 times e to the minus i omega 1 plus omega 2 times t. What else do we have? Um, we have the difference of both, as the headline suggests. So we have E1 times E2 star, E to the minus I omega 1 minus omega 2 times T, plus the complex conjugate of all of that, of each of these terms. But we also have, of course, um, optical rectification of each of these fields. So epsilon zero times chi two times E one times E one star plus E two times E two star. Yeah? Now we can write this um, with new abbreviations. Yeah? One can always introduce new abbreviations, and this is what I'm going to do. Um, we can write this equation as just new abbreviations. So we have second order polarization is now written as a sum of polarizations oscillating at different frequencies. Yeah? You might miss here the complex conjugate yeah? because, because uh, this, as we said already here, is a real number, a real quantity, whereas these things here are complex. Why no complex conjugate here? Yeah? Yes, I put it in the negative omegas, yeah? So I, I just use, oh, I wrote this at the wrong place here. That's not very nice. Um, so this is just what I explained here, right? Um, all these things with the negative sign, um, they, uh, yeah, so they take care of that. So. Fortunately, this is not a real piece of paper, so I can copy that. Oh, not good enough. So let's see. Hmm, and now? <laughs> and now? Huh. Okay, I think I in, uh, create a new page here. Yeah, okay. 
Gut. Ähm. <lacht> ja. Ähm. And now we can find expressions for each of these, uh, of these terms here. Yeah, so uh, we, just by comparing both equations, we can write down for each of these terms an expression. So let's do that. Um, four. So the various positive frequency components are given. So the various positive and later we do the negative frequency components are given by, and so we have P of two omega one, which is equal to epsilon zero times chi two times E one squared. This is of course second harmonic generation. Then we have P of two times two omega 2, which is the same, but with field E2, which is, of course, also second harmonic generation. Then uh, we have P of omega 1 plus omega 2. And this is given by 2 times epsilon 0 times chi 2 E1 times E2. This would be some frequency generation. And um, then we have um, omega 1 minus omega 2, which is 2 times epsilon 0 times chi 2 times E1 times E2 star. This is difference frequency generation. Right? Yeah. And the next point would be yeah, similar for the negative frequency components. Of the polarization, of second order polarization components. Yeah, I don't want to write it down for reasons of time. So what you see is that we created from our two colors, from our two incident colors, we created four new colors. It looks like a very colorful experiment that we can create here. Well, but it's not quite, quite true because there are other things that need to be satisfied in order to create yeah, a macroscopic number of photons of new frequency. I explained this briefly at some point. Yeah, so what you need to make sure is that the new frequencies, that they are, yeah, so when at, at a certain position in the crystal you create a new frequency, then it needs to be in phase with a new frequency that you create a few micrometers later in the crystal. Yeah, we call that phase matching and we'll come to that in some detail at a later point. So now um, let's look at um, the new um, phenomena that we saw here, namely some frequency generation and difference frequency generation. So some frequency generation yeah, um, to things, yeah, so some frequency generation is very similar, is very similar to second harmonic generation. Yeah, so it's kind of, so second harmonic generation is kind of degenerate some frequency generation. What you notice here is that for second, uh, that for some frequency generation we have this factor of two that we don't have here. Do you have an explanation for that? Yeah, look for a trivial explanation. Well, um, if we talk about second harmonic generation 
and we want to understand it as some frequency generation, what we ha have to do is, is to split our incident beam, say, in two halves. Then each of them is one half the electric field, right? And then uh, if we combine it, then we get two times one half, which gives the one that's not written here, right? The factor of one that's not written here. So it's very similar to a second harmonic generation. Um, what are applications? Well, uh, there's one that's particularly important, namely to generate, say, tunable UV light. So usually it's, um, so at least in the, in the beginning um, of, of laser technology, it was quite a challenge to, to create tunable lasers. Well, people found quickly out how, how to do this, initially with dye lasers and s stuff like that. But then, um, yeah, so people realized that it gets more and more complicated the shorter you make the wavelengths. And second harmonic generation is a, is a good way to do that because what you can do is, is to take a strong pump laser, say this is the field E1, and you take a tunable laser that is not as powerful as this pump laser, right? So, um, yeah, so stupid lasers that are not tunable, uh, you can think of, uh, you can, uh, yeah, so it's perhaps uh, um, yeah, natural to assume that, uh, that a pump laser, that a simple pump laser um, is not very controllable as compared to some laser that you, um, on which you have more control, right? And then you would take uh, the strong pump laser, shine it on, a, um, on, uh, on the crystal, and use a, tunable, a nicely tunable laser uh, as a second laser, and you get the sum frequency out at short wavelengths, right? Such that you can do spectroscopy, say, in the UV. So as an application, what an application would be, um, generate a tunable UV radiation. Um, from a strong fixed frequency laser and a weak tunable laser. You can also think about the following application. Say you have some infrared photons that are hard to detect with a usual detector. Uh, so, if you have a silicon detector with a band gap of 1.1 eV, but your photon has, has less energy, then the silicon detector won't detect it. Well, you could then take uh, some, some other semiconductor with a smaller uh, band gap, but suppose uh, you have a really long wavelength and you want to detect the photons. What you can do is, is to mix them with, uh, with a visible laser, and you would get out new frequencies um, so that you can detect each that you create one some frequency photon for each infrared photon. Uh, so uh, this can be used for very sensitive and noise-free detection schemes. So let's go to to difference frequency generation. Difference frequency generation. Yeah, so you might think that some frequency generation and difference frequency generation is pretty much the same thing because, well, 
uh, like we learned at school when we introduced negative numbers. Yeah, so subtracting numbers is just uh, the same than adding positive and negative numbers. Um, here it's a little bit different actually. And um, this you see if you compare actually the quantum picture of both processes. What we do in some frequency generation, uh, and maybe I should write that, uh, I should depict that here, right? What you do in some frequency generation is that you destroy two photons, omega one and omega two, so one of each, and you create one new photon, omega one plus omega two. Yeah. If we talk about difference frequency generation, then we actually destroy one big photon and we create two photons. Right? So this is a qualitative difference. So what we have here is that we come in here with this frequency omega one and we get out two frequencies um, omega 2 and omega 3. Yeah. So the first thing that we would uh, write down here is there is a qualitative difference um, difference between Um, some frequency generation and difference frequency generation as obvious um, from the quantum picture. Yeah, um, and maybe I show a few of, uh, of the applications that we have for... Yeah, so what you see here is um, a figure... Can you switch? Yeah. So... Um, so maybe um, first uh, this uh, nice picture that I stole from the web page of the Trump uh, company. Uh, so uh, there the idea is that you have a strong beam, say uh, this green beam here. And in addition, you, um, you have another beam um, that say you want to amplify. Right? Um, and uh, what you could do uh, then is to superimpose them here on um, um, in, in this crystal and um, you get out um, the difference frequency. Yeah, so what you could do is, is, to, amplify, um, is to amplify radiation. Yeah, so one application uh, would be optical parametric amplification. Yeah, so what you could do is, um, yeah, so in this quantum picture, what you would do is, uh, is to shine in also here um, omega, yeah, so in a, in a very weak way. So perhaps I depict this uh, in gray here to make this clear. Yeah, so uh, you have a weak beam, uh, beam omega 2, just a few photons, right? Um, and what you get out uh, is for each, yeah, so if you um, um, create the, uh, the difference frequency uh, the difference frequency, you get out for each of these beams, um, 
yeah, so you amplify this beam and you get some waste beam omega-3 that perhaps you don't want, right? And therefore, this is also called the idler, right? The idler wave. Yeah? So this, um, this nomenclature, uh, so these names of signal and idler wave, so this here would be then the signal wave, uh, this comes from this application of optical parametric amplification. Yeah, so here you see that omega-2 would be amplified and, uh, well, there would be some, some waste photons, uh, so to say. Um, but uh, actually quite often, uh, this photon, this idler photon, the waste, is sometimes at least as interesting as, um, as the other one. And uh, I'll show you a few um, examples of that. So particularly important, um, well, implementation of, um, of difference frequency generation um, is when, um, when a pump photon is actually split into two photons, right? They are called here signal and idler, but you see that it's entirely arbitrary whom you call signal and whom you call idler. You just split these two photons. And this process is, is very interesting from the point of view of, um, of the fundamentals of quantum mechanics, quantum information technology, quantum cryptography, quantum... Um, um, imaging, and so on and so forth. Because, um, or one uh, point here is, that when you, uh, when you detect in this direction one photon, then you know for sure that there is also one photon here. Right? So in a certain sense, this is a single photon source because you can always say, uh, where the other photons is by looking at these uh, at the first photon, right? At the signal photon, then you automatically know that there also must be an idler photon. Furthermore, they are obviously they are obviously correlated, entangled, and this gets particularly interesting if you take um, yeah if you use what we call type two difference frequency generation or parametric down conversion where, um, where you get uh, out uh, beams with two uh, different polarizations. Uh, each of them forms a cone, right? So, um, and where they intersect, you actually have entangled photons where, well, where you don't know which polarization a photon has uh, has here. However, if you measure it and you find that it has hor uh, uh, horizontal polarization, then you know for sure that the other one must have vertical polarization. Right? And the interesting point is that you can't predict which polarization the photon would have. Um, but when you have measured it here with a certain polar polarization, which is just um, a stochastic uh, thing, right? Then you know for sure what the other has, right? And this um, kind of experiment in this implementation or other uh, implementation is, um, yeah, is one of the most important, uh, most important yeah, discussions of the 20th century in quantum mechanics. Namely, uh, what is connected to that is the so-called einstein podolsky rosen um, paradox, yeah? uh, where Einstein uh, was sure that there is some hidden information that we just can't exist, but uh, he said, um, God doesn't throw dice. So it, there's a hidden variable. Um, that would predict which polarization a certain photon has. And there was a very clever physicist, namely Bell, who devised an experiment with which one can test the predictions of 
orthodox quantum mechanics and a theory with hidden variables. And it turned out that orthodox quantum mechanics is right. right? So there is there's no hi uh, hidden variable here. Uh, OK, yeah, so, um, yeah, so this is not, this will come later here. Yeah. So, um, optical parametric amplification and the generation of photon pairs of entangled photon pairs for, well, um, quantum information technology and fundamental tests of quantum mechanics. of quantum theory and of course quite a few more. Well, let's come to third order processes. Yeah, so we take the polarization uh, that depends on, on three um, amplitudes and um, we would again start just with um, with the degenerate case, where we don't have three different colors that we, that we mix together, but we have just one color and we want to see what happens. So. Two point four, third order, Nonlinear processes. So, um, accordingly, we consider what was written in uh, this in the first equation of the entire chapter, namely. Um, we start out with P3 which is by definition is equal to epsilon zero times chi three and now the field cubed is a function of t of course this is then also depends on t. Yeah. So the third power um, of the electric field E allows three colors to be mixed. Yeah. In order to generate a fourth color. And accor accordingly, people call this process also four-wave mixing. Yeah, so third-order processes are often referred to as four-wave mixing. Yeah, to generate a fourth color in the most in the most general case, We want to restrict ourselves to, um, to the simplest case, namely that omega 1 is equal to omega 2 is equal to omega 3. Yeah, so in the degenerate case, omega 1 equals omega 2 equals omega 3 we have we have the following um, and 
So we write this as P3 of T equals, and now one fourth of epsilon zero times chi three times, um, now I write it explicitly real, the cosine of three omega T, this is what you expect, right? Um, so what we see here is third harmonic generation, but uh, we also have a term that is perhaps not quite, not really expected. So cosine omega t, right? And what we were using, yeah, so by using, um, we write e of t as a real amplitude. Yeah, so remember, script variables are explicitly real, real amplitudes, I should say. Um, so we use this here, and we also use a trigonometric identity, namely that the cosine cube of omega t is equal to one fourth um, the cosine of three omega t plus three quarters, no, it doesn't fit here. So, and cosine cube of omega t equals one fourth of cosine three omega t plus three fourths of cosine omega t. Yeah, so the first term is of course obvious. This is third order harmonic generation. Uh, let's write that down and then uh, we come to the question, what about um, the second term here? All right, so this term here, what does it do? So the first term is obvious, namely third harmonic generation. You know, so what we have is that we destroy actually three photons um, in order to get one photon out. Perhaps better to see in this uh, in this sketch here. So where we have omega, another photon with frequency omega. And we get one that has three omega. Yeah, so what about the other term? What does it do? And this is actually my, my last poll for today. What will this term oscillating at one times omega do? Right, so we have this polarization that you see here. Um, it oscillates at, at omega t. What will it do? Um, and you're invited to, to think about it and to type answers and then you can vote up and down your fellow students' answers. No responses received yet. Now it takes a little bit to type. Not everybody is participating in my little game here. Well, actually, nobody is participating. <laughs> Ah, negatively interfere with incident, with the incident light. Okay, yeah, okay. We create a new frequency and it 
tends to cancel the incident light. This is sum of two terms of omega, which then, ah yeah, so uh, we have two terms of omega, which then through difference frequency generation with another uh, omega, generates a photon with omega. Well, if I, if I subtract one photon with omega from another photon with omega, then I would expect a DC field, right? So I don't quite get this. Ah, okay, so first creating the second harmonic and then subtracting another omega, you get again omega. Uh, what else do we, it interferes with the incident light, but the phase shift has to decide how it interferes. Okay, well, I think uh, some of the answers get close to, to the correct answer. Think back to the first chapter. Think back to the first chapter. When we explained the refractive index, how did we explain the refractive index? So we said that it was the Lorentz model, right? We said that the incident field creates in this piece of glass polarization. Yeah, and this polarization was, of course, oscillating at the frequency of the field. Then this polarization creates a new wave, which, again, has the same frequency as the incident light. So what comes out of the piece of glass is the light field that did not, was not used in order to create polarization, plus the light field that was created by the polarization, right? And we said that because harmonic oscillator and so on and so forth, the light field that was created by the polaris polarization should be phase shifted with respect to the one that did not get, was not used for setting up a polarization, right? So loosely speaking. And so we have two waves that come out that they have a phase shift, right? And adding two waves with different phases gives a third wave of the same frequency, but with another phase shift. And in this way, we explained what? We explained the refractive index. Yeah? So this polarization oscillating at the frequency of the incident field, this is responsible for the refractive index. So now we have the same thing here. We have a polarization that oscillates at the frequency of the incident light. It is quite, this polarization is quite similar to the polarization that we had so far, but it, was, it is also very different to this polarization that we had so far. It is very similar with respect to the fact that it oscillates at the frequency of the incident light, but it's different in the aspect that it depends not on the electric field amplitude, but on the cube of that, right? So, in other words, it is dependent, uh, it will turn out that it's dependent on the intensity, yeah, so this contribution. So, what we do expect now is an intensity-dependent refractive index, or to be more, uh, to, to say it more precisely, what we expect is an additional contribution to the refractive index. The refractive index is no longer a material constant, but the refractive index gets changed
by the laser field itself. The laser changes the refractive index. In general, the laser will increase the refractive index. Okay, let's write that down. And this is, yeah, this effect might look a little bit boring as compared to what we had so far. So far we created new colors and stuff like that. Right? And now we just change this refractive index that is kind of boring because it's solid state physics. Well, I didn't say this. Um, uh, yeah, so we don't create new colors now. And you might think, uh, what it has, does it have to do with optics? In particular with nonlinear optics. Well, quite a lot. It is at it is at uh, the basis of two effects, namely self-focusing and, in particular, self-phase modulation. We'll come to that. Um, and, well, it's one of the most important effects in nonlinear optics. So, um, what about... Um, the term... 3 over 4 of epsilon 0 times chi 3 times the amplitude cube. Well, it creates um, a polarization oscillating at 1 times omega. Yeah, so just yeah, similar to the case to the case of the Lorentz model of the refractive index. And this means we expect um, the index of refraction um, to become intensity dependent. Yeah, and we would write it later in the following way. Yeah, so we would write n is equal to the familiar n naught. Yeah, so the refractive index without a strong field. And then we have another constant, n2 times i. Right? And we will see that n2 is equal to 3 divided by 2 times n not squared epsilon 0 times c chi 3. Right? And the intensity can, of course, be written um, as 1 half times n not times epsilon 0 times c times e squared. Okay. Well, consequences of that. I mentioned that already. Consequences. Self-focusing. Self-focusing. And self-phase modulation. The latter is the more important for us. But we will meet it only in quite a few weeks from now. So, uh, but nevertheless, I would like to show you an example for each of them. 
uh, namely the following. So you know this building, I guess, right? Yeah, we are sitting in this building, right? And a few years ago, more than 10 years ago, probably almost 20 years ago, the powerful laser that's, um, that's installed in this building was used in order to shoot into the sky. And um, if you have such a laser, well, what, do we, uh, what would you have? Um, so consider a laser beam. Uh, then you know if it's a, a Gaussian beam, then in the, on, on the beam axis you have the highest intensity and um, if you go to the wings of the beam, the intensity gets lower and lower, right? Uh, maybe I depict this uh, here uh, quickly. So we have a beam, laser beam, right? And if we look for the intensity profile, yeah, then this would look something like this here, right? Now what this formula here suggests is that the refractive index here is higher than um, out there, right? So in the middle, the refractive index is higher than it is over there, which means that the optical pass lengths um, out there is shorter than here in the center. And you probably have encountered a situation like this before, namely for a stupid lens, right? There you also have a, a, longer, a longer pass length, a, lo a longer optical pass length on the optical axis than, than outside, than at the borders of the lens. So it is clear that this thing here will focus. Yeah? If the beam is strong enough. Right? And as I said, we'll come to that. And here you see uh, this example, very powerful laser. Right? And it, it collapsed to what we call a filament. And um, you can see it because the intensity there is so high that the atoms and molecules in the air get excited so that they emit light. Um, yeah, and this was a few hundred meters long. Now to self-phase modulation. Self-phase modulation you also need, well, what you need in particular is a very short pulse. And the idea is that you now look not at the spatial variation of the um, refractive index, but at the temporal variation. So what you have to imagine is that the refractive index, as the pulse proceeds through, say, the piece, piece of glass, the refractive index gets larger and larger, while the pulse amplitude gets larger and larger and goes down again when the pulse intensity goes down again. So this means that you change the phase, that you create new, yeah, so that you, ch that you have a time-dependent phase suddenly of the light. And if you take the derivative of the phase, the temporal derivative of the phase, then you find, what is the, deri de the temporal derivative of the phase? It's a frequency, right? Phase, if you take the derivative, you get a frequency. So what you create are new frequencies. And now we are there again with the hallmark of nonlinear optics, creating new colors. And here you see an impressive example of that. Um, it's an optical fiber. It's an optical fiber. And you launch short pulses, short red, actually, near-infrared pulses into this fiber. And you see, as they travel through this, through this uh, optical fiber, you create new colors. First, orange, right? Then uh, the orange colors uh, create green colors and finally blue. And what you get out is completely white light. So a spectrum that's an octave broad. This is not just for fun, but
but this was at the basis of a Nobel Prize. So a technology um, that was um, for, for which this kind of frequency broadening was decisive, um, this, uh, it's the so-called frequency comp, right? So if you think about um, a femtosecond laser, then um, it is clear what it does, right? It produces femtosecond pulses. And actually, with each round trip through the cavity, it produces one, femto it emits one femtosecond pulse, right? The length of this uh, cavity is typically on the order of meters. And so what you can expect is a, a pulse strain with a repetition rate of, of 100 megahertz or so, right? So a laser, a femtosecond laser, emits pulses with this repetition rate. Now if you go to the Fourier, to the, uh, if you apply the Fourier theorem, if you go to the frequency domain, then you would see that this laser actually emits a spectrum with discrete frequencies separated by one over the repetition rate. Yeah, so one over the, um, well, separated by the repetition rate, separated by the 100 megahertz. Yeah? And um, now this thing, and I don't want to explain it here, but uh, if you wish, uh, we can uh, discuss it in, in a Zoom meeting. Um, this can then be used in order to, to set up um, a skim that can be used in order to translate optical frequencies into radio domain frequencies. Yeah? So it's very complicated to, or it's very demanding to measure the frequency um, of optical frequencies because the frequency is so high. You can't do it electronically. Yeah, so a radio wave, you just take an antenna and you use a frequency counter or something like that. You can't do this with, uh, in, in optics. If you, want to, if you want to count every optical oscillation, electronically there is no way. But with this um, skim that is based on uh, actually this frequency broadening, it was possible. And it was invented by Ted Hensch in, in Garching who received the Nobel Prize, I think, in 2005 or so for this thing. Because now it's possible to really count optical frequencies with this kind of optical gear, uh, um, uh, uh, so a gearbox. OK, well, the general case of third order processes. And now you see the other phase of nonlinear optics. It gets ugly. Yeah, so if I take here now an, um, a field that consists actually of three distinct fields with different colors, then um, I again can take the now third power of that and I get, well, a lot of frequencies, namely 44 frequencies, including the negative ones, right? And so I can go on and, and find all these different polarizations. And you can imagine that I'm too lazy to write this down a second time. Uh, therefore, I just copied it here. OK. Well, to conclude uh, this chapter, I would like to talk a little bit about parametric versus non-parametric processes. So we distinguish parametric and non-parametric processes where the latter, the non-parametric, oh, let's start with the parametric processes. So the parametric processes are processes where we have, besides the ground state, of course, no real levels being involved. And what I depicted so far were all parametric processes. Yeah, so second harmonic generation, difference frequency generation, and so on and so forth. And now it's clear what, um, what, what non-parametric processes are. This is when there are real levels involved. 
What does this mean? Or what does this imply? That real levels are involved. It implies that real levels are populated. It implies that photons are absorbed and their energy is stored in this excited level. And then it depends on the, on the nature of this atom molecule or whatever, when this energy is released and how it is released. Right? So as long as no photons are absorbed for times longer the time energy uncertainty um, principle, um, then we speak about parametric processes. Yeah? And as a consequence, parametric processes can always be described by real susceptibilities, yeah? which means no absorption. Um, so the energy in the photons is conserved for the parametric case. And the non-parametric co uh, case Energy may be stored in the medium. I said this already. Yeah? So trivial examples. If you think about the refractive index as we discussed it here, right? Uh, we were talking about photons being a kind of well absorbed in quotation marks. Um, yeah, so they set up a polarization, but they radiate this immediately. Well, actually. The re-emission takes place in a time that is compatible with time energy uncertainty. Well, um, the term parametric actually is not quite uh, so where it comes from, why this is called parametric oscillation or parametric something, a parametric process is not quite clear. Um, one hypothesis is that it comes from, from the parametric oscillator from a mechanical parametric oscillator, and you all know it, you all used it, it's the children's swing. What you do there is um, that you peri periodically change the length of the rope. Yeah, so by, by leaning against it, what you do uh, effectively is to change the length of the rope. What you do is you change a parameter of this differential equation, right? And um, yeah, so the differential equation can be, can be written down. Yeah, it, uh, I think it's uh, the Mathieu um, differential equation. Um, it turns out that, um, yeah, so that you have to, um, to change this parameter by, um, by half of the frequency of the, of the swing, right? So it's kind of also a nonlinear process, uh, this children's swing, in a certain sense. Um, anyway, um, it's just a word. Well, now ex examples for, um, for non-parametric processes, yeah? So where we have absorption, saturable absorption is one. Yeah, what is sat saturable absorption? Quite simple. Um, if you have a medium, yeah, if you have thousand atoms that absorb, um, that absorb the incident radiation, then at some point all of them will be excited, loosely speaking. Yeah? And therefore, they can't absorb any longer, which means that absorption is saturated, saturable absorption. And there are important um, applications for that, actually. So let. Oh. So this is um, second harmonic generation. Two photon absorption is, of course, also non parametric because we just need two photons in order to, to get to the real excited states. Right? And then uh, two photons are destroyed and their energy is stored in the atomic system, right? So photoluminescence would be one. Uh, actually, I want to go to saturable absorption at some point. Yeah, but uh, this apparently is also, um, well, uh, actually a linear process. Yeah, so the more photons you get in, um, yeah, so this is photoluminescence. Then fluorescence, so one application is fluorescence microscopy. Actually, 
uh, a picture from, from my lab, uh, the one or the other um, here um, might be interesting to make a, a video out of that. So what we actually have here uh, is a soft X-ray microscope and a fluorescence microscope in correlation. I think it's the first time that this has been done in a lab-based setup um, in the same uh, apparatus. Yeah. And one uh, important example for that is actually stimulated depletion microscopy. There you also make one um, or a pump feel so strong that the uh, absorption uh, is, is saturated. Yeah? So stimulated emission depletion microscopy. Yeah? So it's uh, a little bit uh, the other way around, uh, but it's the same process essentially. And then I finally have, doesn't work. So this one here, another invention by Ted Hensch. We mentioned him already. When he was a young man, uh, still working at Stanford University, he invented or co-invented saturable absorption spectroscopy. Yeah? So if you want to use a laser in order to do spect spectroscopy, you can do this, of course, quite simply. You just take uh, your sample where you want to measure the resonance, and you take a laser and change its, um, shine a laser through the sample, right, which is depicted here in this, yeah, so this thing here is the sample here. No, doesn't work any longer. Um, yeah, so this doesn't help. Okay, so here is a pointer. Well, uh, what's called here the vapor cell, yeah, so this is the sample. And you shine through the laser, um, and you have a photodiode behind it, right? And then you just watch the photodiode as you change the frequency of the laser. The disadvantage is that you don't get a high resolution because the vapor cell is, of course, hot, right? And therefore, you have the Doppler shift of, uh, the, f uh, of the atoms that, uh, that travel in direction of the laser, yeah? so, and uh, the others that go in the other direction. So your laser can be as, uh, as nice as, uh, as it wishes, right? So it can be as narrow, um, so as much single frequency as, as you can imagine. You would never measure something, um, something, something narrow. So you would never measure the natural line width, uh, line width because the Doppler shift is much greater. Yeah? So now the trick comes. So what you do is that you split your laser beam in a strong beam, say in, how is it done here actually? Um, so in, um, in this direction, right? So from right to left. And you take a, a, a weak beam that goes in the opposite direction. Now suppose your laser is not yet at the right um, at the right frequency for this atom, then one beam, um, one beam would see only uh, those atoms that, say, move in direction of that beam because then they are blue shifted and then they hit the resonance, whereas the other beam would see other atoms uh, that move in its direction, right? So, um, if the beam has not enough photon energy, then of course both beams don't have enough photon energies, and both would see just the photons that move towards its direction. Right? But now, if you are at the right frequency, then both beams suddenly see the same subset of, of atoms, namely those that don't move in the direction of the beams. Right? And then you can produce, then you will see that um, if the beam is strong enough so that it saturates the absorption, that more light comes through suddenly from this weak beam. Right? And then you can measure actually the natural line width of the, 
um, of the atom. And in this way, laser spectroscopy made, um, made a big jump in the resolution of, um, of spectroscopic devices as compared to, to the best uh, spectrometers or so, right? Okay, with this, I would like to conclude. I'm a little bit over time. I apologize for that. So see you next Monday um, again. And I think we have a Zoom session some when um, I will announce this on Moodle. Thank you.